it was perhaps oversimplifying to have said earlier that choosing a plan was as simple as just picking the one with the lowest cost. I mean, there is more to it than that. I mean, yes, generally you want to choose the one with the lowest cost, um, but really the difficulty is in devising and calculating all possible evaluation plans. Neither devising nor analyzing alternatives is free in terms of CPU usage or CPU time, uh, and it is possible to waste more time on analysis than a better plan would save. Uh, in fact, uh, you may have even experienced this kind of problem <laughs> Uh, in a professional setting, if you've ever like talked with somebody where there's like a technical debt problem uh, and more time is spent deciding and discussing what to do and how to do it uh, than is actually invested in solving the problem. So yeah, that's not a great situation to be in, at least if you ask me. Um, and so, yeah, you know, be the thinker, not the overthinker, so to speak. Uh, and you know, we want to consider carefully what to do and make a good decision, but we should not get so caught up in analyzing every possible alternative uh, that we just waste too much time and we don't actually do enough. So given that we've already introduced this idea that joins are expensive, a simple approach for doing the optimization is to say, all right, well, listen, joins are the most expensive thing. That's what we're going to um, focus our effort on, that's where we're going to try to do our best to minimize the cost. Uh, and the very simple approach that we would follow is find what joint operations we have and you know, choose the right order. Um, whether right or wrong, the theory is that the joint operations are likely to be the slowest and the longest, uh, so any optimization here has the largest potential benefit. So. We should already know um, something like um, if we are joining three tables, R1, R2, and R3, the little bow tie symbol represents join in relational algebra. There's three relations uh, and there are 12 potential join orderings depending on whether we uh, are going to do uh, R1 first or R2, uh, R3 first, um, like all, all possibilities. Uh, in fact, for n relations, there's a little formula, you know, 2 times n minus 1 factorial over n minus 1 factorial. Um, and some of them are symmetric. Um, that reduces the number we have to calculate. In fact, when you look at the R1, R2, R3, and I said there's 12 of them, you, know, you were probably even thinking, like, what do you mean there's 12 of them? There's not that many relations. Um, but some of them are symmetric because R1 join R2 is the same as R2 join R1. Uh, and as long as we think about them in that way, um, then it reduces the amount of work we actually have to do um, because you know, calculating both of those is not necessary. Um, and for a situation where we're joining more than maybe two or three tables, um, this is probably an opportunity to stop and think very hard about why we're doing this. Um, because it is potentially an indication that our database design is suboptimal. Let's, let's call it that. Uh, Zoidberg may take a, a more negative approach uh, in terms of uh, phrasing that. Um, but yeah, if we are joining a lot of tables, why? Um, the database server might want to ask you why it, it does, it's being asked to join you know, six or eight or 12 relations, but surprisingly, the database server doesn't get to like write a nasty resignation letter saying it can't continue to work this hard due to the negative effects on its health. Um, it will dutifully do the work you asked it to do and, and try to make the best of the situation by optimizing it, um, but we cannot choose all possible uh, non-symmetric approaches for evaluation. It would just take too long. Right? When, we, when we're joining 12 tables or six tables or even five tables, boy, that really is a lot of possibilities. Um, and so the shortcut that helps here is remembering history. Uh, if we can create an algorithm that can remember subsets of the choices um, and the request is you know, combining five tables, well, we can compute the best order for uh, R1, R2, and R3. Uh, and then reuse that result repeatedly for evaluating possibilities with uh, relations four and five. So it turns the uh, five relation problem into effectively two three relation problems, right? We're breaking it up a little, we are making it a bit more approachable uh, and better than that, we're probably handling it with things that we you know, have tested and know how to handle uh, a little bit better. So that could work. 
Now, the resultant approach might not be globally optimal. In fact, it might only be locally optimal because we've you know, produced the best result for R1, R2, R3, uh, and then we've produced the best result for that intermediate relation R4 and R5, um, but it might actually be the case that combining R1 and R4 would be the best option to do first, but we never tried that because we said we're gonna break it up into uh, just these three first uh, and then go from there. That will never be tried in this algorithm uh, where it's computed in a sub-expression. Um, so you know, that is a possibility, right? We don't necessarily discover the best possible result if we use this kind of operation. But remember, this is an estimating process. And as Bach says, guessing is not in my nature, doctor. Um, the statement on the previous slide said that this was a fact. It said R1 join R4 produces very few tuples. Um, and the optimizer doesn't know that for sure. It relies on estimates where available. And so yes, hypothetically, if it is factually correct and we know for sure that it is the case um, that doing it this way will produce the fewest results, then yeah, that would actually be the best operation. But we don't know that. We don't know that when we have to make the decision about uh, what we are going to do. Uh, in terms of optimizing the query that we have been given. Um, so it's possible our estimate was off, the actual cost of a different plan was lower, we don't have to be perfect, we just have to be better than not optimizing at all. Um, another thing that is important is the sort order in which things are generated uh, is important if the result will be used in another join. Uh, and a sort order is referred to as interesting uh, if it will be used in a later operation. So if R1 and R2 are being computed for a join with R3 later, it's better if the combined result from R1 and R2 is sorted on various attributes that match to relation R3 to make that join more efficient, if that's possible. Yeah, uh, if it's sorted by some attribute that is not in R3, then maybe some additional uh, sorting will be necessary uh, when all is said and done. And generalizations are always wrong, as the saying goes. Um, the best plan for computing the subset is not necessarily the best plan overall, and the extra sort might actually be more expensive um, than we expected, and it might be more than was saved uh, by doing the join faster. There's no perfect answers, right? Um, all of this increases the complexity of deciding what we're going to do uh, and how we're going to do it. Um, and we just have to sort of live with the fact that our estimates may be good and will not be perfect. And we'll just you know, use them as best we can. Fortunately, there are not too many interesting sort orders usually. Um, and then there's generating alternatives. Um, and um, we'll talk about uh, a little bit about uh, how equivalent queries are formed. Um, we have already ruled out the idea of generating every possible root. Um, we can't generate every single alternative. Uh, there's just too many of them. You know, Google Maps doesn't uh, consider, I don't imagine, every single road uh, that you could take that gets you from here to Toronto because there are actually quite a lot, including like ridiculous routes that have you, you know, drive via Sudbury. So there's gotta be something that says, you know, we're not going to do it in, in that way, uh, but we can at least come up with a way to generate some alternatives. Uh, and uh, here we have four things that help us to generate a large number of plans such that we could evaluate them and, and make a decision based on them. Uh, number one is we need a way to store expressions in an efficient way, so reduce the amount of space that it takes uh, to store all of those queries. Um, otherwise, again, we're wasting a lot of time and we're wasting a lot of space. Um, another thing that we could use is duplicate detection, so um, finding things that are um, the same as something we've already seen. So if that's the case, we don't have to consider it. Um, we can just move on. Uh, remembering optimal plans, so uh, we don't recompute things uh, that we already know. Uh, and early terminating algorithms. Uh, an algorithm that terminates the evaluation of a particular plan, if it's already worse, than the cheapest one that we found so far. Uh, and we've talked about a number of these things uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of 
early phase termination uh, as a, a previous topic. So uh, you may need to review that if it seems a little bit unfamiliar. The details obviously are a little bit complex uh, and beyond what we want to talk about in, in, this, uh, in this course. The other thing we should um, consider uh, is whether nested queries can be transformed into an alternative representation of a join query. Uh, to summarize a, a very long story, one possibility of uh, executing a subquery is we do it every single time, um, and that's not really nice. Um, so we could avoid that um, by either doing it once, um, uh, or we could avoid it by transforming it into an equivalent join. Um, if, uh, if we don't do the, the optimization, uh, then we are potentially you know, setting ourselves up for uh, doing a lot of, <laughs> of unnecessary executions of the subquery. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one of the things um, that is actually noteworthy about this and just kind of like a funny, you know, back in my day kind of story about this um, is based around this idea that um, many, many years ago, and I think it was my SQL 4, it did not support subqueries. Uh, and so that was one way to force people to become comfortable with the idea of doing a join, uh, that if you simply had no other alternative, uh, then I guess you would learn how to do a join, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> I mean, that's maybe not you know, your, your favorite way of, uh, of having to do it, but you know, it is, uh, it is, it is a way. Um, I don't think the MySQL implementation was intentionally doing you a favor uh, any more than you know, by having a bad optimizer, it forces you to uh, write better queries. Um, it's just funny to think about. Okay, um, but with that said, um, if we want to talk about uh, some uh, heuristics, some rules, some guidelines that we've mentioned earlier, they will help us to uh, understand how to perform the operations that we want to do. Um, so what are the guidelines that, that we would like to follow? Um, so one of them is perform selection early. So as early in the process as we can, we would like to do a select. Um, this cuts down the number of rows in the table uh, that we are going to have to work on. So yeah, anything we can do that gets rid of information uh, so that we don't have to carry it around, so to speak, is good. Um, but there are exceptions. You know, if, if we throw away too much information, uh, then it might actually uh, get rid of something that we were going to use to do a join. If that's the case, then actually uh, doing the select on it is, is probably not, uh, not what we want. Um, so that wouldn't be good. Um, another idea, performing projection early, uh, analogous to the idea of doing a selection early. Um, anything that we don't need uh, doesn't have to appear in the uh, intermediate relation uh, and yeah just cuts down on the size or reduces the amount of space that it takes reduces the amount of data that has to be copied reduces the amount of storage uh, that is needed for it you know all good things again this is only good if we don't throw away information that is going to be needed in a later step if it is going to be needed then we have to retain it tempting as it might be to get rid of it uh, just because we will, again, add extra work for ourselves if we do it wrong. Um, another thing um, in terms of making sure that we choose our plan within a reasonable amount of time is to set a limit. Um, sometimes in like Agile methodology, this is referred to as time boxing. Um, and I personally grit my teeth whenever I hear time boxing used as a verb because I don't really think it is one. but. I'm not the English language police, so um, time boxing is, is the common phrase. Um, and it is just you know, setting a time limit and say, so, okay, at the end of that time, we will go with the best thing that we have, even if it's not necessarily globally optimal. Optimization has a certain cost. Once the cost is exceeded, uh, the process of trying to find something better stops. We've just run out of time and we'll go with the information that we have. That does prompt the question, how much time um, do we think we should allocate? I'm gonna suggest that the answer maybe isn't one size fits all. So that might be something where you wanna think about it a little bit. Give me a minute for considering it. Well, 
one of the things that, that we could consider is um, if it's a small query, a quick query, something like that, then uh, don't bother doing a, a lot of estimation. Uh, if we think the cost is likely to be moderate, just taking a quick glance at it, a, a moderate optimization budget should be allocated. Uh, if it's going to be expensive, then a larger optimization budget is warranted. Um, the idea is that you scale the amount of effort uh, that is put towards optimization based on how complicated you think it is. So if it's a really straightforward query, a simple you know, select from where with you know, very easy conditions, yeah, small optimization budget. If we are expecting to join a lot of tables, then investing more effort into doing this efficiently is probably worth our while. And um, one of the other things that we should consider is plan caching. Um, and plan caching says, well, in any busy system, common queries are likely to be repeated over and over again with slightly different parameters. Uh, if you as a student log into Quest and you're interested in pulling up your course um, roster, um, well, that's a common operation. You know, you want to see your grades from, uh, from previous term. Um, and you are executing this query with your student ID number, but whatever evaluation plan we've come up with could be reused um, when another student does the exact same query with a different student ID number, right? The plan to do it is the same effectively. Um, and yes, the parameters are different and the answer will be different, right? Um, the one student is taking five courses this term and the other student is taking seven courses this term. The answer will be different. The actual estimated amount of time, uh, the estimated and actual amounts of time are different, but you know, all we really needed was an estimate. Um, and if we carry out this query, we can use the actual execution time from last time as our estimate for the next one, or maybe an average of the last n executions of that same query. Uh, if there is in fact high variability, uh, if you are querying a transcript, there is you know, fairly high variability. Uh, for a student who has you know, only taken one term, then you know, they will have you know, relatively few courses and relatively few data points in there. Uh, for a student who is in 4B, uh, they are likely to have a lot more terms, you know, 14 or, or so of them uh, between academic terms and co-op terms and you know, more if you did non-degree terms to you know, complete an option or something. Um, so there could be high variability. So maybe in a situation like querying a transcript, um, you might want to take an average of the last n executions of the query to provide an estimate of how long it's going to take. Okay, so to wrap up this topic, uh, if we're not planning on implementing a database or if we're not analyzing a database or something like that, it's maybe on your mind, you know, is this useful? Is this still something that we care about? Uh, and can we still do something interesting with this? Uh, and I want to say yes, the database is just an example. It's an example of an implementation uh, and something that we are familiar with. What we are talking about in this topic is really about this idea of how to programmatically generate, uh, evaluate, and choose amongst various options for accomplishing a goal. Um, I related it, if you will, to you know, Google Maps as an approach. Uh, and you can imagine that Google Maps maybe does something similar to this. Uh, I mean, without working at Google, I mean, we can't know that for sure. Um, but there is definitely some programmatic generation of alternatives and some uh, evaluation amongst them to produce the uh, estimate that says uh, you, know, you should take the following route. So we talk about the database because it's a, a simple example, or if not a simple example, at least a relatable example. Uh, that should connect to something that we already know, um, but we should be able to take this discussion uh, and apply it to other situations as well.